We're going to continue now with the same essential question of why are industries spatially distributed where they are, but this is going to be part two. Now the first thing is something I forgot to mention in the last foot video when I was discussing agglomeration. So why it is that um, businesses seek or similar industries seek to um, align or to locate near one another. What this is, is the businesses, when, when agglomeration starts to occur, when one industry comes into a different a location and a new industry comes in and the same general, um, in, a business that's in the same general industry also moves into a given area, what that starts is something called the multiplier effect. Now using just simple multiplication as your guide here. The idea is that as more industries in a given place developed, that will drive increasing economic success. So as more potato chip companies, for example, start to come in one given area, that's going to continue to drive even more economic success. That's going to create more ancillary activities. So I'm going to flip back for a minute to last flip video's um, PowerPoint here. If you have more industries coming in, you're going to have more ancillary industries developing. Those ancillary industries are going to continue to develop other industries. So industrialization drives development here, as it says for the actual definition. As more industries develop, a particular industry beco area becomes increasingly economically successful, in particular in a specific industry. So for example, um, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, in Chapel Hill, Ra Chapel Hill Raleigh, Durham, we have an agglomeration there of, um, of uh, research industries and different types of ac um, academic um, research pursuits and many different businesses that would be associated with the research of those given areas. We have as more of those industries come, more of the resources that make those industries successful come, and the multiplicate the development and the industrialization just and the the development um, and the agglomeration just sort of takes off from there. When that happens, that then that region has become experienced agglomeration, um, or they've or better known as they've it's created their regional specialty. So Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Another example will be Silicon Valley in in San Francisco. Silicon again, ref, or of course a reference to the material of the computer chip. So you can see then that map there the the number of high tech industries that are that have agglomerated. That's the regional specialty here. The beginning of one industry and the success of one industry is going to drive and is going to um, going to attract um, similar industries to the extent that you have what's called, again, agglomeration. I'm being repetitive here. Um, and I wanted to mention this. This is something we're going to come back to when we talk about urbanization. Um, but multiplier effect, that idea that this, but this business will be successful and then that business comes, which leads to that business, which leads to that business, that's also an example of what's called cumulative causation. And cumulative causation um, means the pro – okay, so I'm going to give you the formal definition. The process by, through which tendencies for economic growth, things that make an economy successful, are self-reinforcing. It's exactly what I just explained. So if we have the multiplier effect, if a, a, bit, if a new industry is looking to decide where to locate and they, they gravitate towards an area that has an agglomeration, then that's going to make those two businesses more successful. That leads to more economic development. Now bring in a third person. If the third industry is trying to figure out where they're going to start their industry, well, heck, why not start where they already started? In other words, industry is going to, start, is going to gravitate to places that have already existed with that existing industry. What that really means, industry cities of MDCs tend to get to be to drive or to attract um, industrialization over the rural areas of LDCs. This makes perfect sense. If you're considering a new, to be, if you're considering if you're a business owner and you want to figure out where to start your new industry, then it will be so much easier for you to take advantage of the transportation systems, the labor force, every single benefit of agglomeration rather than trying to start off somewhere completely new in a rural area. That, that, that has its complications though, because that of course then means that the richer, rich areas are getting richer and more developed and the poor areas are getting poorer and not experiencing any of that benefit. Something we'll come back to. Okay, some other things that, um, other factors, other considerations that help us answer that question of why industries are spatially distributed where they are. Some other so other things that help us understand why businesses are market oriented. We just talked about this. Let's flip back. We just talked about being market oriented when we talked about minimizing your transportation costs in the Weber theory. You are market oriented if you are bulk gaining. 
if you're a bulk gaining industry, you want to be really close to your market. You don't want to pay those expensive transportation costs. Well, there are other reasons why industries decide to spatially distribute close to them, they're to locate themselves and become spatially distributed close to the market. One of those reasons is if you're a single market manufacturer, if your product is pretty much only sold in one location, then you gotta be close to that location. If you go down to Gallery Place, then you've seen, um, what the heck's that called? The, the, a, a souvenir so shop that, whose name I'm blanking on, right? On Pennsylvania Avenue. Anyway, if you're a souvenir shop, if you're, Washington, and you're selling Washington, D.C. souvenirs, then it would be pretty dumb to locate your firm in Philadelphia. So if you're a single market, if there's only one market you're selling things to, um, similar example would be Washington for sports apparel. I think I have a map here. Uh, did I make it? Nope, I don't. Okay. If you're selling sports apparel for, um, uh, if you're selling DC, if you're selling national Nats apparel, then do not set up shop in Chicago. Not going to be, not going to make sense. So that's another consideration that an industry would consider in their location. Um, similar to agriculture, you got to consider your perishability. Now let's expand this beyond agriculture. Of course, fruits and vegetables, flowers, we already talked about that in the Von Thunen model. But something that's also considered very perishable are newspapers. A newspaper, um, the Washington Post, I'm old school, I get the Washington Post delivered to my door every day. That Washington Post, um, that, that newspaper has to be produced in an area where they can get it to me when they drop it off. I can hear it every morning at 515, they drop it off outside my door. Um, that's the, that the, the production for that newspaper has to be in an area where that the newspaper can be delivered to me every morning. If that newspaper wasn't delivered to me because the production plant was so far away that it was, that it was, um, delivered to me on, you know, at 5 p.m. on every day, then that, then it's expired. Essentially the paper has quote unquote gone bad because the day's already over. So perishability is also something to consider for industrial firms. This last one is an interesting term. It's called ubiquitous industry. Ubiquitous means widespread, found everywhere. That's just a good SAT word. But ubiquitous industries are ones that have to be, that have to, by their very nature, they have to be widespread. For example, a hospital has to be related. It has to be widespread. Hospitals can't uh, follow necessarily the same principle um, as as any other industry that they're going to be they're going to agglomerate that would mean that it, we would have hospitals only in areas that for example have high research or have like really research tri triangle park that would be like if all hospitals agglomerated there well that's certainly not going to help somebody in Oregon if all of the hospitals are agglomerated in research triangle park instead hospitals have to exist in direct proportion to the population there has to be a, a, a hospital that serves the northernmost areas of Montana, be I mean, be it of course far away from the population versus one that's down the street in a more densely populated area. But point being that in ubiquitous industry, you don't necessarily get to consider those same ideas of minimizing transportation costs and labor costs and everything else. You, your, your market has to be, you have to develop in direct proportion to the population. Some other examples of that are chain businesses like Target and Walmart. They're gonna, they're gonna um, consider not necessarily where they're going to be minimizing their transportation costs, but where they're going to be maximizing their exposure to the market. Um, another another shift here. So let's put this on the left hand side here. That um, for the last three things. So we were talking about other re reasons that ind industries would be oriented close to the market. Here we were talking about the multiplier effect and agglomeration and how that influences where industries are spatially distributed. Um, the type of economic system in the country also contributes to the. Um, the influence of whether or not there's going to be industry in that country. There are three, and these are really, really, really simplified and condensed discussions of these three economic systems. So please, if you're an expert of this or this somehow goes public on YouTube, then, you know, forgive me for this way oversimplification. But this is um, the type of economic system present in a given area or a given country is certainly going to influence whether or not an industry is located there or how that industry is going to operate if it is, in fact, located there. For example, capitalism. Okay, capitalism is the is the economic system that you and I are most familiar with. And this, the economic system of capitalism, um, this it almost pains me to give this simplistic definition, but the capitalism is, is an economic system premised on the idea that a competitive market, so the, the forces of supply and demand, are going to determine the price of goods. If people are if the market is left to its own devices then if people really want something, then that will dictate the price. If people really don't want something, they're not going to buy it, and then the price will go down. Now, that is way oversimplifying the very complicated systems there. 
But generally speaking, capitalism lets the market decide. So the prices of a good is decided by whether or not people want it. The advantages of a system like that are that the businesses are all privately owned. Um, and theoretically, this is going to create quality control. Um, in many ways, you can think of this, you may have experienced this in your own life in relationship to charter schools. Charter schools in, utilize the same concept of capitalism, that if a public school isn't doing it, what people say to be its job, it's not performing well, or perhaps it doesn't offer some sort of curriculum, then the, the charter school is going to create competition. The charter school is going to compete with the school, the public school, for, for students. And if they're going to outperform the, the public school, then so be it. And then you've got a more successful charter school. Or, in turn, it forces the charter school, the public schools to perform better to make sure that the, uh, the students stay in those public school systems. That's, that's the idea of a charter school. That's what many of you guys may have attended charter schools. Um, actually, I know you guys have attended charter schools since so many, such a huge percentage of students in BC do. Um, so theoretically, the system of capitalism in an economy, it's going to create quality in, in, in the idea that it's going to create competition and goods and goods that meet the demands of people. The problem is that there's always going to be winners and losers. There's, there will always be the haves and the have-nots in the system of capitalism. There will always be people that are successful and, retain, and experience the benefits, and there will always be successful, or there always will be people who are not successful in the system of capitalism. Industries are going to consider whether capitalism is going to help them. Generally, I mean, a really broad strokes um, overview is that capitalism is going to be friendly to many industries trying to, to start off their business on their own. Um, there's another economic system with the system of socialism. In the socialism, the government controls the basic, um, some basic items in the economy. So it may control food prices, it may control energy prices, it may control transportation prices. And the idea being that if the government is able to tax, have high taxes on people, then the government can provide health care and services for people. It basically, it's controlling the economy. It's making sure that certain services and certain ideas are provided for for people. As I mentioned, the problem with that is it's very high taxes that, that you can't that healthcare is provided to people, for example, but that's not free. That's provided, that's paid for by taxes. Um, but some people criticize this economic system as minimizing incentives. So if an industry is looking to create um, a new firm in a particular location in a socialist economy in a socialist place, um, some people criticize this system as de-incentivizing hard work that people won't necessarily work as hard if they're provided with services. That, again, I, I'm, I'm cautious and I'm putting that in quotation marks because that's sort of theoretical, but still a common criticism of a socialist state and something that, so, that a firm would consider if they're, or a business would consider if they're looking to start an industry in a socialist place. Lastly is communism. Communism is the government has total and complete control of all prices of goods, from bread all the way up to the utilities, so the price of electricity and water and everything else. Communist is a state-controlled economy. And the advantage is theoretically, as Karl Marx, the founder of communism, um, hoped for, would this mean there's no poverty. If nobody's rich, then nobody's poor. Um, and then, but of course the problems, which are tremendous, is that this provides the government with an enormous amount of control, an enormous amount of power and control if you're controlling the prices of everything. And in, in many senses, I would argue that this is impractical in that in a growing world and growing um, world in a growing world and a growing population, that the there's never been a real true application of communism whereby there's that everyone is equal. As I mentioned, you need to have a tremendous amount of government control. Communism is not going to be necessarily as friendly to private industry and to the location of an industry because it's going to be controlled funneled by the government. So if a if a company is considering where where they'd like to start their industrial firm. The, the presence of capitalism, the presence of socialism, and the presence of communism is going to very much influence the decision of a large, say, transnational company if this is if they're deciding where to start their firm. Of course, um, then putting on the left hand side, a huge component of of your industrial uh, location decision will come down to transportation and communication systems. Um, so industries have to consider their options for transportation. This is a connection back to the origins of industrialization. We talked about the availability of rivers, the availability of coal to actually fuel the plants. Well, that's no different in modern day in the sense that there has to be applications. Well, th those are references to the energy sources for those industries. But generally speaking, you have to consider your, your ability to transport the goods that you are then producing. So there's, there's four main types of transportation um, options. There's a plane, which of course you can ship anything on a plane, but that's extremely expensive. So it may be very quick, but it's extremely expensive to ship anything by plane. And of course the weight is a concern. You can't ship 
you know, if you're a car manufacturer, you can't get 15 cars on a flight, you know, with any sort of practical or cost-effective measure. Um, rail is often the most cost-effective way to transport over long distances and, of course, over land. Um, trucks are good for long distances and, of course, on land. Or, excuse me, let's just say short distances on land um, because if a truck, I mean, you can't, not everybody lives on a rail line, so um, trucks are often a good option there. And ships, of course. Ships are slow, very slow, but they're, and they're, but they're the most inexpensive and they're very good for heavy products. So these are the four general transportation systems. And the, the world now that you and I live in, our shipping is basically all, the way goods get to you and I, um, from our from the table that I'm looking at here to uh, to the pencil that you and I are you're likely taking uh, notes with, all of that really is generally moved around the world in what's called container the container system. And this was developed after World or really during World War II to maximize production. And what you're looking at right there are pictures of containers. Those and those containers are standardized. The, so the modern shipping methods around the world is based on this standardized and mechanized system of transporting goods through containers. Um, if, and that's a very, a, being very redundant tonight. That's that, that makes sense that when you're saying and that that's the idea that the container is just the same exact size, the same, um, the same exact size so that whether that container, as you see in that top picture is sitting in a port ready to be picked up. You see those cranes, it's totally mechanized. That crane can pick up that container and quickly move it to another area because it's mechanized, it's the same size. And that's the same size that you'll put on a rail car, as you've seen down there. That, that container, is, if it's all standard, that can move from ship to sea to rail to truck in one fell swoop. And containerization, what you're actually looking at with that second picture where the crane is moving containers onto a, uh, into a, a port area, is actually called a break of bulk points. Break of bulk is when a good is transferred from one mode of transportation to another. Let's take this back to our essential question. If we're talking about where industries are spatially distributed and why, then industries are going to ensure that they are easily, they're located in close proximity to a break of bulk point. If they're shipping, they want to make sure that they can, they're located in an area where it's easy to shift goods from a ship to rail or rail to trucks, right? That's the industries are going to be cognizant or aware of those break of bulk points to maximize to uh, to minimize transportation costs and to maximize their efficiency. So break of bulk points, and sometimes you hear people say the break bulk um, break bulk labor, meaning that they're the labor associated with uh, transferring goods from one mo mode of transportation to another. So planes to ships, ships to rails, rails to trucks. There's labor involved in each one of those break of bulk points. But with this container system and this modern container system, that that's really changed because modern modern container systems took away so much uh, of human labor, and now so much of the transfer of goods is mechanized. If it's if it's all the same size, it's, you just need a machine that's calibrated to that same size. So this is the presence of container systems, the presence of transportation systems. All of this influences where the industry is located and how industry. And how goods, those industrial goods, are um, are distributed to the markets that they're intended for. Um, this is just kind of a cool. I'm going to take a second to pull this up here. Um, this is a cool. This was emailed out on the ever so cool AP Human Geography teacher list serve. Um, but these are pictures of the. There's the flood video I just uploaded. Um, pictures of global markets that are or global ports around the world. So let's see if I can uh, make this bigger. So you can take a look here at these pictures. They're pretty cool. They're, they're pictures of um, the of container ports all around the world. Here's one in Dubai and UAE. You can see there's one. Actually, I want to go back to the first one. This is Guangzhou in southern China, one of the major, major industry point uh, port areas. Yeah, it says here, these are the world's biggest ports. And it says, the no surprise that the world's biggest ports are in China. Over the years, Singapore was known as the world's largest container port. Few things traveled throughout Asia without stopping at some point in Singapore. Today, that seaport has been overtaken by Shanghai in China for some two years now. Mainland China ports account for 70% of the top 10 ports of the world. That's pretty crazy, and that's cool because that connects back to the idea that of China as, a, um, as a, a, in its role in um, global manufacturing and how that's changed and how China's increasingly becoming a role in global manufacturing. So you can see this is uh, that the, the, there's Tianjin, China, somewhere I've actually been, which is pretty cool. 
Um, and this, this is just an example. You can see all those massive cranes and they're unloading the containers. That was in the UAE one we saw. Here's Guangzhou. Um, tremendous amount of exports there. Quindu, uh, Qindao is another area in China that uh, you can see them just those cranes just ready and willing. You see that ship down there to, to pick up all the cargo that's being shipped out. Um, that, um, is and then a lot of this is a result of outsourcing, that the industries have been outsourced to areas where the manufacturing is much cheaper. And then what you're looking at is the literal picture of that outsourcing, where the, the goods are now being shipped to markets in NDCs, another port in China, another here's one in South Korea, um, another in Hong Kong, two of the four Asian tigers that we will discuss, um, four major areas of industrial growth. Here's one in Hong Kong, um, and then let's speed through this. There's another one, another Chinese, and this one in the Singapore, and the new number one, of course, in Shanghai. So a pretty cool vision of just how goods move along Earth's surface and why it, and how the consequences of industries moving and why they locate where they do. Okay, here are your analysis questions. There are five, and we will go ahead and take a look. The number, one, the one I'm most concerned with, and the one where most of my grading will be concentrated is on number five. So for you to consider the last video, Industrial Location Theory, Fotelling's Theory, Olmid's Spatial um, Interaction, tri Olmid's Triad of Spatial Interaction, and this video that talks about some of the other factors that go into the um, considerations for industrial firms and why it is that firms are located where they are. And I want you to explain to me which of those factors best explains the location of industrial firms and why. All right, that'll do it.